Welcome back to the Star Wars Newsnet channel. My name is Tyler, joined on this beautiful Monday by my good friend Luke to talk about Darth Plagueis and where we might see Darth Plagueis pop up again. We were introduced to him for the first time in live action, like in the flesh. We saw his, his royal majesty in the flesh for the first time and the season finale of The Acolyte, which we know is not getting a second season. But I think there is definitely a clamoring or an interest in further, you know, investigating and further developing this character and, and diving deeper into what, you know, he was doing uh, before, you know, Palpatine was even in the picture or even with like a Palpatine. So, uh, Luke, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I know we're very excited to to get into some Darth Plagueis talk and, you know, the best ways to incorporate him, you know, further into canon or live action books, whatever. But first, um, how are we How are we doing on this uh, Monday? Are we ready to talk some Star Wars? We absolutely are. Um, any day we get to talk about Star Wars is indeed a good day. And today we're talking about Darth Plagueis, which this has got to be one of the oddest phenomenons in Star Wars. It's this character who is barely canon now, is actually <laughs> canon, but there's just everything about him that we do know right. is legends and is probably top three, top two most popular legends characters. So there's a lot of love for this character. I think a lot of people want more. That's a, that's a statement. It. That's a statement. I know. Top, and top I, three legends character. Favorite I, legends. It's like it's such a yeah. broad thing to say, but I mean, that's, that's also like a, that's a massive statement considering you know, he has, he, he, you know, he was canon before the Acolyte just because of the, uh, you know, because of Revenge of the Sith. But in terms of the expansion of Darth Plagueis, yes. But that's that's a bold statement considering how many incredible Legends characters there are. I'm thinking off the top of my head, the ones that you hear the most buzz about are, I would think Darth Plagueis. And then there's like Darth Revan. And yeah, like Revan's Mara Jade story. are yeah, like Jade. these like names that will never go away. They're just legends characters mm -hmm. um, that. So mm -hmm. this is one of those top three that we got to talk about. Right. Today. Yes. And so and it's interesting, too, because like with Darth Revan, like they've I believe with Rise of Skywalker and it like did the visual the they character. like we have him character like canonized, but we have no none of those stories told necessarily are canonized. So that leaves a lot. Mar Jade's going to be one that never sees the light of day in, in live action or in the new can in you know the Star Wars canon. I would be shocked if that ever happened. But yeah, I would say Darth Plagueis definitely is up there, which is remarkable if you consider the number of books that Mara Jade is in, or you know they have like the different stories, you know, video games and things like that with Darth Revan, or if you even think about uh, like a Darth Bane's. A story yeah. is fleshed out in the Darth Bane novels, the Darth Bane trilogy. There's three books. Darth Plagueis, we have the one novel pretty much, and it's just called Plagueis. And personally, it's my, oh, I don't know if it's my favorite Legends book. It might be my favorite Legends book. I don't know. It's it's really close to being up there. I, I think about some of the like New Jedi Order books that I really like. I absolutely love, you know, some of the, you know, Rogue Squadron, uh, you know, books that Michael Stackpole, Stackpole wrote as well. But Plagueis by James Lucino is definitely near the top of my list. Yeah. Um, I have been in line to listen to the audio version of it for uh, almost three weeks now. So I'm waiting to actually read the mm -hmm. book. Um, okay, so I'm pretty close. So I'll be mm -hmm. reading it here shortly. I do, you know, have a baseline knowledge of mm -hmm. some Darth Plagueis stuff, but uh, right, it's obviously so, such a popular book that it, like I couldn't just check it out immediately from my library. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's pretty impressive. So yeah. when we're thinking about Darth Plagueis in like future projects, like where will he show up again? And I always call him His Royal Majesty because, um, because you know he is. Honestly, this is this is going to sound like really stupid maybe. 
he's one of my favorite characters in all of Star Wars. Just because, and you know, and I don't mean like, oh, like I love Darth Plagueis, like he's my he's my favorite, isn't I'm championing him all the time because he's some well fleshed out character. Obviously right. not. I think you know that my number one like Star Wars, like like I don't know, character, like in terms of uh obsession is maybe Palpatine. Uh in terms of, like my favorite hero, we talk about Ahsoka, you know, as like my favorite, but like in terms of just my favorite like obsession of character, it's Palpatine. Like I, I cannot get enough Palpatine. And right. so in that one seemingly just, you know story throwaway line story when he talks about darth plagueis the wise and revenge of the sith immediately i am obsessed with darth plagueis like i want to learn more about palpatine's master how did palpatine be succumb to the dark side in the first place where did he learn these things you know anakin falling to the dark side in large part because he heard this story about plagueis as well and so i've always been obsessed with this character and so when we got the acolyte show one of the the big things I was hoping for as the show was announced was that, you know, when we figured out the timeline of everything, we figured out all, I was like, okay, it's possible they could work in a Darth Plagueis here because I don't, I kind of get upset when people are such timeline sticklers when it comes to things that have never really been fully canonized. Like Darth Plagueis is X amount of years old or this person uh, was born in this, you know, time especially when it comes to characters like Plagueis that we essentially know nothing about outside of a, a Legends novel that we have. And even the Legends novel doesn't get into the nitty gritties of like his birth and what that looks like. There's a lot of room for interpretation. There's a lot of room to say the dark side of the force can expand someone's lifespan. Like who's to say how long he's really been around. So there's so many possibilities to where it could continue. So I was really excited to see him pop up in the Acolyte finale, even though the Acolyte as a show was not exactly what I think either of us were hoping for in terms of, you know, audience adoration and in terms of overall quality either. I, I was disappointed in several aspects of it as well. But like any Star Wars, I found things to enjoy from time to time. But Plagueis being at the end was big for the future of Star Wars because I think we could still tell stories with him. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's what maybe most people could pull out of the show is even if you didn't like it at all, mm -hmm. um, Plagueis shows up in that eighth episode. And I think even people who don't like the show would be like, well, you know what? I I do really like Plagueis. I, I do want more Plagueis so at least I'll take more of that like mm -hmm. even if you're like I I hated it don't want season I'm glad they canceled it like but I did like Plagueis I I want to know more so yeah I think I'm you know I'm also in that Venn diagram middle like I like the show I also want more Plagueis so mm -hmm. what's going on there um it's a good I like how <laughs> you do have this niche obsession with Palpatine and so I think it only makes sense to me that you'd be like oh we're introduced to his master. I need to actually do a deep dive on him as well. Like, no so surprise I've there. I always loved Palpatine. No like, surprise. as a child, even, like, watching the Emperor for the first time, like, in, you know, Return of the Jedi, when he makes his way down off his starship into the Death Star. And that was just, I've always loved those lines. Like, I quote Palpatine lines all of the time. And maybe this makes me a bad teacher. I, I quote Palpatine lines to my students or something, you know, so be it, you know, Jada or whatever, you know, like whatever yeah. students that, uh, that, um, uh, is, you know, doing what they need to, I, I'll do whatever. Uh, and so I, I'll quote to them some Palpatine from time to time. Um, uh, I love my classroom. I love the Republic. Like you're something like that, but, uh, you know, things like that, but no, I, I've always loved Palpatine. And so when we we got wind in Revenge of the Sith of Palpatine's master, I was what, like eight years old or something like that. I'm obsessed. Yeah. Like I, all I want yeah. is more of Palpatine's master. I was obsessed with the Emperor. I was obsessed with Palpatine. And that continues to this day as we've gotten, you know, different stuff with the Clone Wars, which, you know, further uh, added to the mystique of Palpatine things from Rise of Skywalker, which I wasn't a big fan of Palpatine coming back. And I'm the biggest Palpatine guy there is. But I'm, I'm going to be excited to get more Palpatine lore. And so with Plagueis, 
I am really curious because anecdotally speaking, I live in a Star Wars bubble to some degree when, and I would say that we both do where, you know, we come on, we do our shows, we write articles for Star Wars Newsnet, we're talking with Star Wars people, and I have a lot of Star Wars people I follow. And so everyone in my immediate Star Wars circle is aware of who Darth Plagueis is. And I want to say for the most part, when they had the brief shot of him in the Acolyte, immediately knew who that was because we knew, oh, he's mute. This is probably the Sith of the time, possibly like this would be, uh, this makes sense. However, that's just me like anecdotally speaking from my interactions. I'm curious and I wonder what you think though, like how many people watch the, Granted, not many people watch the Acolyte uh, based off of the streaming One of numbers, the problems it had. But one of the problems. But what, what percentage of people that are casual Star Wars fans, they just like watching Star Wars, they're not going to deep dive into what, what Plagueis looks like, or they may have just had to refresh their memory on that one brief line from Revenge of the Sith. How many of those people actually watched that episode and went, oh my gosh, that's Darth Plagueis? Or did they have to like do one of those, oh, let me search on YouTube who the mysterious guy in the cave was in the Acolyte finale? Um, I would love to know what you know a casual's opinion on that would be because I, I would put myself in a Star Wars bubble as well. I think I absolutely live there. Um, I see a lot of very niche stuff on my timeline. I don't, I'm not a casual. So I am wondering myself it, what those people thought when they were watching this show. They were like, you know what? Um, mm -hmm. Haven't watched a lot of Star Wars, but there's this acolyte thing. I'm going to check this out and say they make it through all eight. There is no, he has no lines in episode eight of acolyte. Mm -hmm. There is no mention of him. Uh, he hasn't talked to like, Right. It's not immediately clear unless I guess you're watching the credits and you see like he right. might be there. Um, well, unless, if you're a diehard Star Wars fan that is obsessed with Star Wars to some degree and you're like, I know who Plagueis is. I know what species he is and I know what time period we're in to where it's theoretically possible he could exist. I think you knew who that was like. Yes. For the most. Part, absolutely. Yeah. Outside of um, that. I'm wondering I'm, I'm, if you're like, you know, the people who have maybe watched only the movies and maybe just haven't read any books um mm -hmm. if they even watch the acolyte but i thought i i really don't think it'd take much selling to get someone to buy in on the darth plagueis aura mm -hmm. um i think it's right. all you need to know is a refresher on revenge of the sith like you just said like well mm -hmm. this is sidious's master and so mm -hmm. i think that could immediately be like oh you know i've never actually thought about that no one's ever really that's only been mentioned once by him in one movie right. and like half of a scene like that's interesting yeah i think i could actually get into that like i don't mm -hmm. think it takes much selling to to garner up some excitement for more stories about mm -hmm. this character i think there's plenty of people that are really interested in dark side stories and the exploration yeah. of like the sith and the lore of the sith and so this is it kind of gives you that that lore, but also it still has ring some rings of familiarity because of the connection to Palpatine and the connection to the prequels and the Star Wars movies. I am just really curious. So my barometer for what I used to gauge like a casual Star Wars fan was I would, you know, ask my dad if he, you know, was able to to recognize. But my dad over the last like three years has is no longer considered a casual because <laughs> I think deep. really it, when I started writing a lot for star Wars news net, like about, oh, it would have been like four years ago now, maybe uh, when I started like three or four years ago, when I started like writing some reviews for star Wars yeah. Newsnet's joining the team and now like doing like our, our shows every week, I would say that was around my dad was like, Oh, Tyler, like loves star Wars even more. Like maybe I'll start diving into star Wars even more because I was also telling him about, Clone Wars and Rebels and the new Clone Wars season that was coming out. He's like, oh, I yes. want to watch the new Clone Wars season, but I don't know anything about Clone Wars. And so then he very quickly watched all of Clone Wars. He watched all of Rebels. He's done rewatches of both. He has read every single High Republic book for the most part. And I think he hasn't read like a couple of the 
the middle grade. He hasn't read any of the middle grade novels and he's missed some of the young adults, but he's read most of them and has also read like lost stars or like master and apprentice. Like I gave him brotherhood. Like, so he's no longer in the, Hey, he's a casual fan. He he's in the weeds texting me about, (laughs) you you know, what's going to happen between like Elzar man and Avar Chris down the line. So, my barometer for what a casual Star Wars fan, like I don't really know if that I have that line anymore because most of the people I talk to about Star Wars are people like you, my dad, or some of my other friends that are with Star Wars Newsnet and uh, or online all the time and are reading these things. So I really am would love to know how intense like a Palpatine or a Plagueis story, like how quickly would that gravitate? Because I'm I'm with you. It wouldn't take much. Like let's we can yeah. go ahead and start talking about like the different ways that we could introduce him again. And I have a few ideas and I want to throw those at you. And then if you have some counterpoint ideas, some that I don't think of, then let's absolutely you know talk about it. But the first one I think is pretty easy. This one to me, it makes the most sense uh fiscally. For Lucasfilm right now, while also making the most sense given the current slate of everything they have going on. And that is, after the Ahsoka Season 2, the next show is like a live-action Sith lore show. And it is a Plagueis training Palpatine live-action show. And it is basically them setting the seeds uh, for the Clone Wars. It's, It's them, it's him kind of going through... And training, you know, Sidious and what, you know, he needs to know. I don't think it has to start off with him finding, you know, him and like starting off. It could jump in wherever leading up to when uh, I don't want it to lead up to episode one because I want Ian McDermott to pretty much play that character. But maybe like an earlier line where he's beginning in the beginning stages of training. I think that could be something that's interesting is their exploration of life. You know what that looks like could happen. Personally, that's not the direction I would love Lucasfilm to go uh, in terms of like what our story should be. But if a trailer for that came out and said, you know, have you ever the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? They throw in that scene from Revenge of the Sith. You cut to Darth Plagueis and boom, launching point. It's a dark side show. It's a little bit darker, a little grittier. Uh, you can still have, you know, some, you know, fantastical like, you know, classical star wars goofy vibes with it but for the most part it's going to be like a bit of a like a dark it's a dark side show so i think that's the most obvious path forward to see plagueis again in terms of like uh on on our screens to reach the most fans and i i would agree with you i think it takes the least amount of creative work to like come up with like i think that sounds like the most obvious choice to get more of this story with Darth Plagueis. Um, I I can't help but thinking to myself personally, like that'd be such a smash hit because Palpatine is regarded as one of the best villains in cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, at least one of the most powerful. I think it'd be fun to explore that, um, that origin story there that mm-hmm. maybe, maybe it does conflict with the novel. Um, again, haven't read it yet, so I don't know how much you would be able to work around that, but or incorporate it in. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I you agree with you that I really in. it could work. I really like that Ian McDermott would be, you know, clearly like this is be- much before that would mm-hmm. be taking place with Episode One. So Acolyte is a hundred years before Phantom Menace. Maybe this show could take place. 20 30 years before phantom menace i'm not Mm -hmm. sure but um i think that'd be really fun um Mm -hmm. and i know a lot of times with these legend stories um i've read a lot of drew carpishan with darth bane and darth revan Mm -hmm. stuff he usually if you're going to explore darth revan or darth bane he will throw in the um kind of a foil storyline that is following some light side character so i think it'd be fun to kind of bring in a new senator or someone or maybe a new Jedi who is trying to kind of follow this lead of like, well, something's going on with these senators or this banking person. That's Mm -hmm. like 
way too powerful for their own good. And so there could be a fun story you could play out there and spin out. So right. I think this makes the most sense that like a show diving into like Plagueis is the main character. Palpatine is the main character like with these two. I think it'd be really mm-hmm. fun. I think it'd get a lot of views. I think that's really interesting. That's that's not pulling a punch. That's mm-hmm. going hard like mm-hmm. we're doing it. I think that would be really fun. The only here's the only problems with it from like a financial maybe standpoint because I think that like the big problem sometimes with Disney's Star Wars right now they've maybe tried to do too much and these budgets are so big in so many different directions. So if you scale down to just one main show that you're trying to to run off of, it makes more sense to have a bigger budget if it's just if we're gonna focus along this one show. But I can't imagine it would be cheap to have like the effects needed to make Plagueis look good all the time as a main character. Like that has to be probably a pretty difficult um, thing. So I think you would, the selling point for the show would be like the Palpatine origin story show. And you would have more of Palpatine and Plagueis is like intermittently dropped in. I think that would be the selling point. And again, that, that's not the direction I want Star Wars to go. That feels too much into like, I don't need a Palpatine origin story unless they pretty much here's, here's where I would maybe push back against myself a little bit. I'm worried that they're going to do the whole, like we're going to make Palpatine super relatable. Like he is this kind of like this yeah. Disneyification of the villain and like, Oh, like I'm we're gonna make him really relatable and someone that you feel sorry for. Like he, oh no, like he maybe he, he wasn't was so wrong. So yeah. yeah, like something like that. And I'm like, no, like Palpatine to me is the embodiment of pure evil. Like that is what he is, that is what he has always been, and that's what makes him so compelling and such an amazing villain because he is just pure evil, but he's so can be so charming he can be so cunning he's so brilliant conniving that he's able to to play all of these different parts if they were to do something that that made me just feel like an emotional attachment to palpatine outside of like what i have i know him to be i think that that would be frustrating for fans as they did that but if they approach this from the standpoint of when we meet palpatine he is already like a corrupted you know, he is hungry, thirsty for power. That's all he cares about type character. And then he meets Plagueis or this is early on after meeting Plagueis. I'm all in. Like I'm all in. If you can, if you promise me that we stick to that, I don't, I don't want the other thing that, that I think would. And I, and I, someone that I like a lot of star Wars, I think that would upset a lot of star Wars fans too. Exactly. Um, I think the reason he works so well, um, and maybe that there hasn't been another good, great villain on his level is because they will try to make the villains relatable. We have Kylo Ren who... Or redeemable, you know, I guess, maybe is a better word. Yeah, too. or like there's just no redeeming qualities with Palpatine. And I think that's mm-hmm. great because most of the time, sometimes, you just need a villain who you just need to defeat, who is mm-hmm. who's evil. Sometimes there's mm-hmm. people out there who are evil. And I think mm-hmm. I think it'd be the wrong direction to go and I'm with you. Like, I don't need to relate to him. I don't need to see him as this tortured soul. I don't need to feel sorry for him. I think it's okay if like from early life, he has just been this person who's like, you know, I am very entitled. I'm free and rich to do whatever I want to do. And I'm choosing to do evil. I'm just choosing mm-hmm. to be selfish and, and evil. And I yep. think... I think there's real people out there that do that. So I think mm-hmm. it's it's real. Like, I think there's a real story to tell there as well. So um, I'd really enjoy this. I think that mm-hmm. if you did it right, like we're kind of wanting, um, it'd be really cool. I think mm-hmm. I'd like it. I think that that's the direction. If they were to do that, that would be the direction that I would love to see it. Okay, number two, and this this is like a big brain theory right here. Okay, this is this is me. This this I'm going to say right now. This is never going to happen, but but this will be another way I could see them incorporate on a on a mass scale. Like we're going to start big and like start, and then we're going to like scale down a little bit to like maybe with the more realistic things. Like I don't think we're going to have <laughs> the Palpatine Plagueis you know show. That to me yeah. is the easiest way for them to 
to do it on a level that still reaches a lot of fans. So when I say easiest way, I meant, you know, easiest to bring like tons of people are going to like see it. They're going to know about it. Yeah. Um, Versus like, you know, we'll talk later, like books, comics, like those are like very niche things that not a lot of people would be be reading. So if in the Ray movie, okay, we're going to the Ray movie now, this Ray movie, I wonder if the villain could somehow be like tied to the Sith still in some way, like a new order of like Sith type um, something. And he's trying to take the best of like what the Sith empire used to be in terms of, you know, this massive scale and what they, their ideals were to the more Darth Bane line of like rule of two and, you know, everything uh, following Darth Bane. And then I wonder if you could get some sort of like some Sith flashbacks or something if the villain is exploring Sith lore and we at different times, maybe is the, the villain is, you know, visual seeing things from the past or like he finds like some Sith holocrons that give him knowledge or visions of Sith from the past. And he's trying to uncover those those secrets to kind of create his own dark side cult, so to speak. I wonder if you could, we could see some flashbacks with like a Darth Plagueis and that's how he is, you know, visualized on a movie scale at some point. Like maybe we get him in a movie because we go backwards in time for a little flashback. I like it. I think that'd be also not pulling a punch. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, like you said, good tools that are in universe for exposition for audiences who are out of universe are kyber crystals that you can bleed. There's we've seen in the comics, like there's a journey you have to mentally spiritually go through to bleed a kyber crystal. There are Sith holocrons, which are just tools to like give exposition to people reading the book or watching the show. Like I think those are really fun ways to have this character kind of go through mm-hmm. character development themselves, kind of push them further, but also it gives the audience um, a flashback, a story to see something from the Sith Wars, from the old Republic, from mm-hmm. the high Republic, probably not, but um, for dark side, at least like it would be really cool to maybe have um, someone who was also alive at the time of Darth Plague as it, it would probably rip the Darth Plagueis novel to shreds. It wouldn't be able to be canonized, but like if there was his equal out there who was in the dark side, who was also, you know, hiding from the light side of the force, the Jedi, Mm -hmm. um, he just chose not to take on an apprentice or he did. And they still kept secret. They hid away. Like this could just be a reemergence of a Plagueis era Mm -hmm. person. So I think Mm -hmm. it could work. I can visualize this happening. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and that's sometimes with like a flashback like that, if we're following, you know, I love the idea of like we're following Ray kind of on a journey and she is uncovering like her own path, the future of the Jedi. And like she's pushing forward, like what can we do to make the Jedi like go forward into the future while we're following our new villain who maybe is reaching far off into the past to figure out what is like, you know, oh, this that'd that be I'm cool. feeling. And we have That'd these two really people cool. on these different like playing fields and they're both growing and developing in different ways. And uh, I would love if, if like this villain, maybe he goes in, in a flashback, I think for casual fans that are not necessarily wouldn't know Darth Plagueis right off the bat or aren't familiar with Darth Bane and the Sith Wars and Darth, the uh, oh my, my gosh, Darth was his name, like darth malgus or you know some of those people like you could have a flashback scene where they have a brief moment with some of these characters and uh they're doing something that helps give knowledge to the new villain and for casual fans they might think oh my goodness that's cool just old dark side users or old sith that we're seeing in this flashback versus like the diehards we we know all these characters are like oh my goodness that's that person that's that person anytime you can give an easter egg or a callback or you know that that still builds on the plot but doesn't take away the enjoyment of like a casual viewer like it doesn't take anything away from their journey not knowing what that is I think that's a great way to, to drop it in. It's whenever you have something thrown in there and I'm supposed to know 
what that means if I'm not aware. I thought that was something that Ahsoka got into a little trouble with at times in season one was yeah. sometimes I feel like some characters were like, I'm you're supposed to really care about those characters, but you're not sure necessarily why yet. And so um that but that this would be a way possibly to to give us a brief look at Darth Plagueis on the big screen. Yeah, I really like the trope. Um, just like the kind of the format of Ray rightfully caring so much about what the future is going to look like and how to build that up and for our villain to be obsessed with the past and how to kind of repeat the power that was found in the past. I think that would be kind of just a cool like helix around each mm -hmm. other, just twirling around each other, like obsessed with the future, obsessed mm -hmm. with the past. How do those clash in the present? That's cool stuff. Mm -hmm. So that would be, those are like the two main ones. Okay, the next one. So we're going to start scaling down a little bit. Animation, Tales of the Sith. Like we've had Tales of the Jedi season one. We've had Tales of the Empire. Supposedly, Tales of the Jedi season two is happening. At this point, we're wondering if Tales of the Jedi season two was actually just Tales of the Empire. That's what and I'm convinced of at this point, but... Until the year is over, I'm I'm gonna <laughs> hope and pray that we have like a like a tales of it just just not to sidetrack, but we had the the Halloween special, right? Like you know we had or the yes. not the Halloween um, special, we rebuild had the, the galaxy, rebuild the galaxy in September, yes, right? Yeah. We have Bad Batch that finished, Bad Batch finished immediately after Bad Batch finishes. We have tales of the Empire, and then we have several months of waiting to rebuild the galaxy. And you're telling me there's not anything for animation on the deck. Like, I'm not supposed to expect anything for animation for how long? Like, there's not even, like, word of anything else. That's what makes yeah. me think that we're going to have um, some Star Wars animation. It may not happen this year, but I don't know. November or, you know, February, March, like, something to have right before Star Wars Celebration, possibly. And then they announce the new... Uh, animation show at star wars celebration i just feel like having nothing going on in animation for star wars for like a full like calendar year outside of rebuild the galaxy doesn't yeah. i don't know i just i can't i don't imagine that happening I, I i know that we had you know we had clone wars and then we went straight into bad batch like the next year and then we've had a season of Bad Batch since then. Like, I don't see them... Like, that's an easy win for them, is having these animations. So I feel like Tales of the Jedi's still coming. But maybe I'm just, you know, a little bit naive in that right now. I think from 2014 through this year, we have had a season, a season of an animated show dropped. 14 through 17 was Rebels. 18 through 19 was resistance 20 through 20 was clone Wars season seven 21 bad batch through the current year so like you would think that there would be maybe another season of another like drop of tales of the mm -hmm. jedi that could happen in november around thanksgiving you're a month out from uh skeleton crew um, a few weeks so, out, it's yeah, the third skeleton crew. So that's what I'm True. thinking. Okay. But to me, Tales of the Sith is the next logical place yeah. to have Plagueis. The next logical place for animation to even go. These are having ta Tales of the Jedi and Tales of the Sith is just the easiest money maker for Star Wars, like that there is. Like I don't know because there's just the beauty of Star Wars is that it is not like a singular story that you have to follow and it has to all be connected. Those are things that the MCU is running into problems with right now, trying to interconnect everything and still making me care about it here and there. The beauty of Star Wars and what Star Wars has to evolve into and I'm, is that it is a anthology that spans tens of thousands of years. And has tens of thousands of planets, characters that you can develop. The concept of the Force exists in all of these eras. And you have this, this history of the Sith, this history of the Jedi. Now, that's not to say that Star Wars shouldn't and won't always be intricately connected to the Skywalker saga, to the Skywalker characters. Our first attempt at a non-Skywalker saga 
project on a big on a big scale did horribly in the acolyte in terms of like viewership for the most part and online reaction toxic um, online reaction and i'm not saying that we have to just abandon all of that but i'm saying the beauty of star wars is that you can't and we have to slowly be able to evolve to be able to do that i think animation is a perfect place to begin that because i think the people that are watching animation religiously are the ones that would be excited to see a tales of the sith with characters like Plagueis, or even going back to Darth Bane and characters we haven't met before, or uh, High Republic for the Jedi, or Old Republic, you know, Jedi. I think that animation is the perfect place to start, you know, dipping our toes again in there. And Plagueis obviously has connections still to what we've seen before. But Tales of the Sith seems like a, a shoe in to get at some point here in the near future. Absolutely. Um, I was meaning to text you this thought i had it's not something super fleshed out but it's just i've been really impressed with the higher public and how they've fleshed out the light side of the force um mm -hmm. it's very jedi centric and i think another era that has a lot of legends but doesn't really have anything canon would be the older public and i think that's a good that's a good space to flesh out the dark side of the force i think it'd be fun to mm -hmm. put one episode of tales of the sith there one episode mm -hmm. with Plagueis one episode it just makes sense like I think that's a it's just a ripe place to tell some stories for dark side stuff and mm -hmm. that's what people want people want enjoy darker grittier stuff like they can handle it uh, and I, I also think there is like people that want to watch the dark side and you can do that without making some super and or level adult show yeah, exactly. He doesn't or or like when we say like this, like I'm gonna start watching like the Penguin on HBO. Like Star Wars right? does not have to be like a Dark Side show does not have to be the Penguin where they're violently, you know, murdering and slaughtering people in cold blood in a gruesome, like gross way. You know, dropping the f word every you know few minutes or whatever. Like that's not what Star Wars is. That's not what Star Wars ever yeah, it doesn't needs need that. to be. Doesn't yeah. need to be, but you can still have like a dark show that still appeals to you know different ages. Like as a kid, when I was eight, nine years old, I would have loved to watch like dark side stuff. Like everyone growing up knows who are the coolest character action figures to get when you're playing Star Wars Battlefront. Who are you usually playing with first? It's Darth freaking Maul, Darth Vader, General Grievous, you know, exactly. the Emperor. You know, those are the characters you're probably playing with first. Yeah. Um and kind of a little bit of a tangent, but on this line of thinking is like, we have visions, season one and two. There are mm -hmm. some real dark stories that are told, dark side mm -hmm. stories that are told in those. I'm yes. thinking of, um, oh, I don't remember the exact title, but it's like Howler's Screecher's Reach. That's what it is. That episode yes. is chilling and it's, it's children are the main character. And mm -hmm. I, it's possible. It's totally possible to tell something that is centered on the darker side of the force um, and still be accessible for all ages. Like it's stranger things. Yeah, exactly. Point proven. <laughs> like we yes, can do this. Like, we can absolutely do this. Plenty of shows like that. Yes, absolutely. Star Wars. Uh, it, and it comes down to story. And I am a firm believer that if the acolyte had done a better job of just telling a, a better story, I, I think it would have been fine. I really do. Cause I think, I think Star Wars word of mouth for a good story is going to is still going to sell call call me naive call me uh whatever you want but i i genuinely i do believe that the star wars brand just needs a really invigorating rich story and it's boom we'll be right back to where we were you know seven years ago in terms of hype level again like i really i really believe that uh so Animation seems like an obvious place for Plagueis to pop in. I would say Tales of the Sith, yes. Like, obviously, like, let's let's go ahead and, and ch chop that up as we're going to see that at some point. Like, I would be surprised if we never get Tales of the Sith. Okay, now we get into the really niche, like, category here. And I'm going to say I think that we could definitely see Plagueis pop in in another book. Like, we could see a Darth Plagueis chimere story even of what happens after the acolyte and after that season to help those people out we're already seeing a jackie and yord 
uh, prequel novel to the Acolyte coming out. We're seeing another one with Vernestra Rowe and uh, Master and Dara written by Justina Ireland. The Orjeki one's written by Tessa Gratton. And so I would not be surprised if at some point we hear, I'm just spitballing, I don't know, Kevin Scott is writing a, another Darth Plagueis novel or something like that. Like he's going to be putting forth the first, you know, canonized Plagueis novel. They're that bringing back James Lucino. I think James Lucino has got to be like 75 years old. He's, he's got, uh, yeah. he's got another all timer cranked up in him. I'm sure <laughs> he's got one left. He's got another in him. Let's bring him back. Wheel him out. Come on now. He could do it. It's a champ. Um, Absolutely. Not knowing anything about James Lucino's whereabouts at all, but <laughs> that dude can cook some Plagueis, though. Absolutely, and I've got um, just this past one week ago, I received as a gift Catalyst, a Rogue One novel by James Lucino, and I think that one is also pretty good. So he's he's a great storyteller. Wait, he um, wrote he wrote Catalyst. Well, I like how absolutely he did. Absolutely. Okay, kind of like how you're just second guessing what you just said. <laughs> but I didn't know he wrote Catalyst. I completely blanked on that. And that wasn't that, that really wasn't that long ago. Um it was like 2016, 2017. Yeah. I mean, because it's based on Rogue One. Rogue One. So, it's like, so yeah, like 2016, 17. Okay, it's so like seven, eight years ago. Okay, yes. He he's ready. He's, he's still in the pocket. For one more. <laughs> he's 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 in the pocket. Let's go. Um yeah, this novel is probably the most likely to actually happen. We really want the show that we were talking about. We really mm -hmm. want a movie reference. Animation would be cool. Book is probably like going to happen. I would, mm -hmm. I'd be kind of surprised if it didn't happen. Um, at least mention. Yeah. Comic run feels like it could be pretty easy to do. Um, but we have this project luminous group of people who have done a great job. Um, they've added to that group to fill out this higher public era. Uh, and we're seeing those two of those authors uh, mm -hmm. penning a book for the Acolyte. And Plagueis being in the Acolyte, I just think it makes sense to maybe bring in Kevin Scott or someone of that caliber who's familiar with how this era feels already to pivot a little bit and bring <laughs> us a couple hundred years, maybe a yes. hundred years, and give us some dark side feel of the higher public mm -hmm. um, and can also write a dark novel right um kevin scott can absolutely write a dark novel he can do that you know what uh why did i forget his name george mann is really good with mythical stuff he's really good with mm. darker horror he writes a lot of horror outside of star wars so george mann's been on a star wars like heater like he is packing heat right now in star wars from i have he darkness has... last year Man. to tears of the tears of the nameless to echoes of fear like this dude is he's become he's, like he's just awesome right now maybe my favorite. yeah like he's become maybe my favorite high republic author maybe my Whoa. favorite star wars author i don't know he's really up there okay oh he's cooking though. i think he could do some really good stuff with darth plagueis i think he could do some cool okay. stuff in that era i mm -hmm. I would say if anyone's going to do it, I would want him to do it. I'd be excited for a book from him focusing mm -hmm. on Plagueis or something involving him heavily. So am I forgetting anything? Am I, or am I leaving something out? If you, is there anything that you would have like Darth Plagueis doing? Like anything that, like any other ways that we can incorporate him back into it? Because Acolyte season two, like I know there are, some fans in good faith that are going out there trying to do petitions or tell people like that they want the acolyte season two to happen. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of those people that's banging that drum, but I love people that advocate for, you know, things that they believe in that they love and in a, in a healthy and positive way. And I think a lot of those people are doing that, but you know, it's, it's not, that's not something that's going to be in the cards, but there are some characters that I would still like to see fleshed out a little more. Is there anything I'm anything that you would say like, Oh, if they, they could incorporate him in this, this direction or what do you think? I mean, the one that we didn't flesh out a ton is a comic series and, and for yeah, a good but reason, but like, that's just, you know, those don't to... sell 
millions of copies. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, on our he, screens though, is there any other way on our screens that we could, you think we could see Plagueis outside of what we just basically talked about already? If they, so if they're not, they said they are not doing a season two of the Acolyte. Right. Um, maybe they want to just completely pivot and say, we're going to do a Darth Plagueis show. I think that is kind of what would happen, actually. Like the first vision you talked about where it's a Palpatine origin story and Plagueis is peppered in. It feels like that is more of the direction they would go if they're going to do a show. They wouldn't mm -hmm. try to like, well, we're going to continue that thread from the Acolyte. I think they're just chopping that off for live action. Like the Acolyte has finished. We're not going to try to like tie up some loose ends in live action. They're going to do it with the books. So mm -hmm. I don't know how many options are really out there for that. It feels like if they're going to do anything for Plagueis, it would be a brand new type of story. Like his rise in the, it sounds so boring, like his rise right. in the banking clan, how he gets, do we talk about his master? Do we give Plagueis mm -hmm. an origin story? Do we get his training? Mm -hmm. um, it's, how heavily do we want to invest in this character? Is there enough? Can he carry right. his own show? Can he do that? Like, I, I think that Plagueis, uh, here's the thing. Plagueis could carry his own show fiscally. The amount of money I think it would take to, for the effects of making him right. look that good as a primary show in a series, hopefully having like 35 minute episodes to 40 minute episodes. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Like that this is something they would never do. Um, yeah. But ultimately, I think what we did say are all theoretically possible in in some level. So are there any other characters from the Acolytes that, you know, outside of Plagueis, we've talked about Plagueis, would there be, is there one that you really want to see like their story continued? Because, you know, the Acolyte was what it was. I felt like the last episode, it finally figured out what kind of a show it needed to be. It just took forever maybe to get there. And a little too long. It took a little too long. A little way too long and <laughs> i i don't know for me it's chimere like that's the only character i really want to like see fleshed out more and it's it's chimere just because i'm interested in that relationship between him and plagueis what does that look like his past as a jedi and manny jacinto is freaking awesome and his biceps are insane yeah he he's a very attractive man we'll say that <laughs> and <laughs> If you didn't say Chimera, I was going to. Mm -hmm. It's a great one. I'm really interested in, you know, how that character's story wraps up. What happens after that eighth episode? I'm super curious because he is not in the Phantom Menace. So mm -hmm. what's going on there? Um, but I'm also interested in Vernestra. She has been a delight to read in all of the High Republic. Um not exactly a delight to watch in the acolyte um so i'm curious maybe if there could be some redemption in her future maybe the end of her life the end of her story could be great and wonderful and uplifting and a hope to all of us <laughs> so mr president of the fan club I am the president of the Vernestra Rowe fan club. Yes. And I love Vernestra Rowe. We're talking about like my favorite High Republic character here. <sighs> I don't want to get, I've ranted and raved before about <laughs> how horribly her character is portrayed in the Acolyte and how I don't understand why she's even in the show, why we right. had to pack, pick this one character from these books to bring in makes no sense to me why she is written the way she is, how she is nothing resembling the character we see in the books. Granted, she is a hundred years older nearly than what we see in the book. Something like that, right? Is it, it's like a hundred years or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. it is. So, yeah. uh, so obviously a lot changes in a hundred years, but I can't even recognize that character. And that's fine to some degree. There, there are some things in tears of the nameless that I, that make me go, okay, I could see you what direction she's going but at the same time i am 
she was just kind of like a boring character in the show for the most part till the very end. And I have no desire to continue watching that. Like, I really, I really don't like, I would love to see what her and Yoda talk about and, you know, things like that, but there's nothing that happens with her in that show where I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see what happens next. Like, it's very clear that her and Chimera had a falling out. She used her light whip to attack him. And that's that it's, felt like we just i hate to i i am like a positive person you know me i like to defend and i will defend vernesta Rowe. it just felt like it just felt like ta uh being a fan of a character from these books and you as a book fans we rarely get wins in terms of like canon appearances or uh them taking yeah. something that happened in a book and just keeping it to where that book is still like you don't have to go through like hula hoops and jump through hoops trying to figure out Tales what? of the Empire did that to a Thrawn novel. Yes. And so with Vernestra, it was like, oh my gosh, we're about to freaking win. Like we're going to get the dub Massive that we have dub. been craving for years in terms of like book fans being like, let's go. We're getting something for us. And then it felt like it legit felt like a slap in the face. Like it really did. I don't need her to be the ultimate Jedi hero coming in using her light whip around like Indiana Jones, insane acrobatics, but they're painting one of the ultimate heroes of the books I'm reading right now as like a villain in like a villainous like character here. Like, and a shady character with just a lot of bleh, like mixed in. And Vernestra is anything but a bleh character in the higher public. She's very strong willed. She's a freaking prodigy. She has these hyperspace visions. She goes um, as a, you know, way seeker. You know, it's it's just incredible how they, in my opinion, it's just it was a botched opportunity and it was just very frustrating. So I almost yeah. am at the point where I'm like, I don't want to see what happens next in that story. Like I don't because I feel like I'm just going to get more frustrated. So <laughs> I'll take my Justina Ireland novel. And now Justina, I'm guessing has to play cleanup here. And that's what I'm thinking. Too, a, is... She's got to write a novel that shows why Vernestra is the way she is now. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Like I'm bracing for impact, but I trust Justina at least to do it. Cause Justina is amazing. And I mean, she's created. Pretty in, and yeah. Created she's Vernestra integrally Rose. character. Yeah. She's... So anyway, thank you for listening today. Um, we always try to bring you this podcast every Monday to start off your week uh, with a little bit of Star Wars. You can catch us on Thursdays as well. But before we go, before we go, uh, I have one more brief rant that I'm going to go on now. Uh, but before I go on this rant, I just want to say Thursday nights, 10 o'clock Eastern time, Star Wars News Net Live. Saturdays, check out the Timeline Show on saturdays luke and i will be on episode 30 of the timeline show this week talking about into the dark you can catch last week's episode of the timeline show covering light of the jedi we're going through every single star wars canon material story in order the best order that we can that makes sense you know you just follow along you'll understand we do that <laughs> but first i was not able to be on star wars news net live last week and Loki upset that we decided to have the High Republic ranking tier list episode when I am not there. I mean, that was that was just I was sitting here. I felt like I was being uh, thrown under the bus intentionally with some of these rankings. I felt like some of these rankings were made like, oh, we know Tyler will not approve of this ranking. So we're going to we're going to drop this one in here. And Nate. Jay, you know I'm talking to you guys right now, um, for sure. Love you guys. Uh, but, Luke, you guys, as a group, put Path of Vengeance by Kevin Scott, a great writer. Path of Vengeance is not a great book. You put that in the S tier of High Republics. There are only five projects that you put in the S tier. Cataclysm? Deserved. Lie of the Jedi? Deserved. Temptation of the Force? Deserved. The Blade comics? Des I... I don't know about dessert, but I'll I'll give it to the blade because I do love the I do love the blade. I love Puerto Ringo, so I, I'll say dessert. So there are five. How many projects do you think I would put above Path of Vengeance in the High Republic? Because it does not belong on the S tier. Over like what how many projects do you think? Just a real quick, 
I did my own personal ranking before I went on live last night, and my S tier actually had quite a bit in it because I really love the higher. Public. Oh no, you're you're um, the, you're too much of an optimist. That's why you need yeah. like some of the other people on there to like absolutely to level you out because you're like I have I have 36 in my S tier. <laughs> what it was <laughs> so uh, strikingly accurate, but um. <laughs> How many books are above Path of Vengeance for you? I'm so, going to okay, say. Okay, so let's not include the three novels that you already have, like the three projects you already have, like that are already on there: Cataclysm, okay. Light of the Jedi, Temptation of the Force, and The Blade. Those four. We're not no one include those outside of those four. How many do you think I have above? How many more Path of would be above it? I'm going to say ten more projects are above. Path okay, keep track. I'm just going to go through and I'm just going to say Rising Storm. Absolutely. Path of Deceit. Are you kidding me? Of course. Tears of the Nameless. Get out of here. George Mann cooked. Uh, Convergence. Zerneda Cordova. Put some respect on Zerneda's name. 100%. Um, let's see. The oh, the High Republic uh, Wave 1 comics with Keith, Skier, Avar. Oh, 100%. That, that deserves above. Oh, Edge of Balance mangas are good. Yes, 100%. They are above Path of Vengeance. Um, Fallen Star? No, I would not put Fallen Star. High Republic Avengers? Yes. Oh, Eye of the Storm? We we had Eye of the Storm below Path of Vengeance? Those comics are incredible. Absolutely. That's what I, I thought. Have darkness. I, I have Darkness. Two tiers above Path of Vengeance. Tales of Light and Life. Throw it up there. Quest for the Hidden City, Into the Dark, Escape from Valo, Test of Courage, and Beware the Nameless. Yes, 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 and yes. Uh, Battle of the Jedi audiobook. Yes. Uh, Tempest Runner. No. I will say Tempest Runner. No. Let's see. Mission Disaster. No. Defy the Storm. No. High Republic Phase 2 comic run. No. High Republic Avengers. No. Crash Point Tower. No. Planet X. Yes. Uh, Out of the Shadows. No. And then Midnight Horizon is an s tier novel i'm throwing that out there at s tier novel midnight horizon absolutely um high republic phase three comic run no no let's see and then we have the deep high york no monster triple physique no tales of enlightenment i wouldn't say yes but no <laughs> like no um, starlight <laughs> stories no so how how many how many that was 17 more projects above yes. the vengeance. Yes. <laughs> Justified. I feel I was like holding that in. Uh, I've been holding that one in. Um, and that's nothing. You know, I, I love I love talking High Republic. And, I, and you know, I like Path of Vengeance. I, you know, kidding aside now, I think it is beautiful that we have so many of these books and projects in this era that Jay and Nate can say they love Path of Vengeance. That's like one of the best novels. And then I can think of 17 other novels that I like or 17 other projects that I like more. I think that's actually like really cool about the High Republic that there's so much rich content in that era and everyone can have like their different, you know, spots of what they like. And to some degree, it is completely justified. Like the something is completely like justified because there's a lot of good stuff in Path of Vengeance, of course. I just think it's like way too long of a book for what it does. But that's the beauty of the High Republic. It's kind of like Star Wars movies. Like everyone kind of has their trilogy or like their movie for each trilogy they love. Like, you know, people that lo like Return of the Jedi is like your favorite Star Wars movie. And it's like number like four on my list. But no one's going to like I'm not going to attack someone for loving Return of the Jedi. Right. Like, I, Phantom Menace is probably like my second or third favorite Star Wars movie like ever. I don't know. Like it's in the top three. That's outlandish to some people, but you know what? It's it's freaking Star Wars. Like the High Republic novels, there's so many great ones there. But yes, so 17 plus the four, I will put Path of Vengeance comes in ranked number like what's 22, 21, 21 <laughs> on my list or something like that. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I do love when uh, I look online and there's people ranking like their favorite High Republic books or total projects, mm -hmm. and they're very different. I never yeah. see the same person. I never see the same ranking twice. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's very different. I love that. Mm -hmm. And everyone has like the different characters they gravitate gravitate towards more, and that's like they have all these different 
intertwining stories for the different eras that go. And it reminds me, uh, real quick, uh, before we get out of here, we had a comment from your guys' live that uh, I saw where um, it was he was so nice. I was like really uh, impressed. And normally I, I never really want to bring up comments on the show, of course. Like typically, like I you know, let the people comment on how on um, how they would like. But this is such a this guy was such a big fan that I had to say it because uh, he said that, you know, they're all terrible. And you guys should stop chilling and vibe for Unites of the Old Republic and, or like the originals, you know, original stuff. And I just have to say, like, he's read all of it. Like, they're all terrible. That's impressive. He's read every yeah. single High Republic piece. Props to you. Keep supporting Star Wars so we can get more High Republic content. Keep keep buying it all. Uh, keep eating it up. I absolutely appreciate that. Um, Luke? You are a treasure of a human being. You know being. what's incredible? He read the yes. first novel and was like, this is terrible. I'm going to read 29 more. <laughs> that is that is perseverance on another level that I've never even had. So It's impressive. Hats off to, hats off to that guy. Um, appreciate it. So, Luke, thanks for joining us uh, here today. I appreciate it. Talking with you, talking Star Wars every week. We win an hour on Darth Plagueis today. Fantastic. That's a perfect perfect use of time for anyone like that is incredible uh please like and subscribe uh to the youtube channel check us out on apple and spotify more of an audio uh thing we got going on here right now but apple spotify check us out there and you can catch us every monday we bring you some sort of star wars i sit down do something star wars related with someone usually it's luke thursdays star wars news net live uh, 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. We talk about the latest Star Wars uh, news from the week. I think last week was my first Star Wars Newsnet Live. I hadn't been on since uh, a long time. So hopefully we don't have any more storms and I don't have to worry about missing a Star Wars Newsnet Live. Of course, check out the Timeline Show uh, for us. You can follow me on Twitter at Tybred5. Uh, please, everyone, for light and life, remember that we are all... Republic.